All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. I won't really talk much more because I just gave a 10-minute little introduction. So I think it'd just be great to dive in and have you all just briefly introduce yourselves and what you're working on or how you're contributing to Bitcoin. We'll go ahead and start with you and just go down the line. All right. So hey, my name is Alexei. I've been working on Bitcoin research since 2015, always trying to find new ways to use the technology beyond just payments and holding. So we looked into side chains, merge mining early on. Um, and today we're building um, a new Bitcoin Layer 2 stack to really enable new applications and use cases, um, really positioning it between Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the other multi-chain ecosystem. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, Could you Mike? move the mic a little? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, Andrea um, with Bitcoin Frontier Fund. And basically, we invest in founders building new use cases on Bitcoin, which I'm excited to talk with all of you here today. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Samantha. I'm the CEO of Alpen Labs. Uh, Alpen Labs, uh, I co-founded last year. Uh, the focus there being building ZK-enabled application layers for Bitcoin. Uh, we think that there is a lot of utility uh, that we can bring to the Bitcoin asset and also a lot of uh, you know, Bitcoin as a settlement layer, a lot of value to be unlocked there uh, through the applications that we build. Uh, and uh, a bunch of what we're doing is powered through the practical advances in zero-knowledge cryptography uh, that enable us to build the platforms that we are. Hi. Everyone hear me? Get a little closer. Hello, hello. All right. Uh, I'm David Shea. I'm a co-founder of a project called Babylon. So Babylon does the following. So we have uh, 500 million bitcoins, 500 billion bitcoins, sorry, sitting there, not very useful. And we have a new use case for these bitcoin, which is to use it as a staking asset to stake on any proof of stake chain you like. And that's the new protocol we're building. And the staking is trustless. So there's no bridging, no centralized custodial. Perfect. Thank you, guys. So. In my presentation, I was talking about how you know, early January, ordinals just kicked off a whole wave of people coming back to Bitcoin and you know, experimenting, innovating, and so on. Some people may come out and say, you know, why are developers even bothering? There are other ecosystems that exist. They might have more capabilities you know, because Bitcoin's design space is quite limited. And I feel like you guys have a good answer for that. So who wants to take a shot? Alexa. I mean, I, I can give my two cents. Yeah, let's hear it. Um, I mean, I think if you, if you take a step back, right, just looking beyond the functionality and, like, look where Bitcoin comes from, Bitcoin was the thing that started the entire space, right? And it is the asset that is most widely adopted outside of the Web3 bubble, maybe, let's call it that. Um, Bitcoin has over 100 million users, right? Of course, maybe not all of them are as active in DeFi as on Ethereum, but it is really widely adopted. It has penetrated a variety of sectors ranging from department stores and even governments. And if you look at crypto adoption today, when somebody starts with Web3, they usually get into Bitcoin, right? I would still say that 90% of the people who start with crypto start with Bitcoin, and then they move on to ETH and other kind of systems. Um, so as a builder, kind of tapping into that ecosystem and being one of the first projects that you know, new users interface with is a massive opportunity. Um, and, of course, now if you think from the institutional side, Bitcoin is the one thing that is robust, hasn't changed, and is predictable, and is definitely going to be around in 10 years. So if you're building something for the long term, you can be certain that you know, you're investing your time into something that's going to stand the test of time. And I think these are very strong arguments for really not just you know, experimenting with the next ETH killer, but actually going back to the origins um, and building on Bitcoin and trying to you know, figure out ways to make that asset and that system more useful. Totally agree. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that. I think you know, we know that Bitcoin has been lagging behind the, the other chains in terms of the innovation that we've seen in the space. And it's also given it kind of like an advantage in the sense that we've seen the use cases and we know what works on other chains. So it's also an opportunity to, for builders to bring that to, to Bitcoin and test it out. You know? So if you have a use case, it has a product market fit, right now is a really great time to bring it into the space. There's low competition, 
technically there's lower risk because you've already seen it work elsewhere. There are going to be challenges more on the technical front for sure. Um, but I think from you know the the potential uh, that that it enables and and provides, I think that there's it's an exciting moment to be at and to to try to bring that back to Bitcoin. And as you said, you know the 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 chain that started it all, right? So. Um, I think one other point to say is, uh, as we're, you know, last year with everything that happened in the, the financial um, uh, ecosystem, you know, there's been a pushback from investors to, you know, come back into the space and invest as they did before. But with what we're seeing with ordinals um, specifically, it's basically uh, prompted investors to start to look at Bitcoin more closely as an opportunity. and. Whereas in other chains, you might have you know, some investors being a little bit more hesitant. Here, we're actually finding that investors are really interested in seeing use cases and how they can get involved. Yeah, that, that's really great to hear. Go ahead, do you want to add to that, Simone? Yeah, I wanted to add, um, I, th I think building on, right now, building on a Bitcoin layer is the right contrarian bet. And I think that for builders and, and maybe Peter Thiel, that should turn some heads, right? Like that's, the reason it's contrarian, I think that's, that's maybe more straightforward. Most people are building on other ecosystems. Uh, but the reason, my argument for why that building on Bitcoin layer today is the right bet uh, is, is a bit more nuanced. I think it's, you know, if you, if you look at basically, uh, you know, applications that are trying to scale in other ecosystems, the, the the converging sort of infrastructure is around modularity, um, where execution environments are kind of separated out from these monolithic blockchains. Uh, and you have these base layers that provide you the data availability guarantees, the, you know, the, the immutability and, and, and uh, settlement sort of uh, aspects. <clears throat> and in that world, in this modular sort of world, Bitcoin as a base layer is a really strong candidate, I would argue. Um, I think we'll have execution layers that are more commoditized, more roll-ups that are built, uh, and we'll have a, a few base layers that, uh, that are used to secure these uh, execution uh, environments. Right? And so if you look at kind of the broader trend of where uh, you know, Ethereum is going, et cetera, I think there you'll see that uh, you know, there is a, actually a really big use case for Bitcoin as a base layer to power a lot of kind of future uh, applications. And uh, you know, building on a Bitcoin layer in this, in this way, uh, I, I think is the right bet today. Yeah, so I agree. Uh, so you know, the biggest value in crypto, I think, Web3 Warren, Web2, is this notion of decentralized trust and decentralized security. And so the most valuable thing in my mind of Bitcoin is that it has the longest history and the strongest amount of security, decentralized trust behind it. And so our project is basically try to take this security and spread it to the rest of the ecosystem as opposed to just confined within Bitcoin itself. So I think to us, that's the biggest value. And if you think about order notes, right? Why is order notes uh, such a success? One reason is because it is re well recognized that Bitcoin is very secure. So if you want to create a piece of art that lasts for decades and centuries, then you would like to put on something that would last for decades and centuries. Yeah, perfectly, perfectly said. Andrea, one thing that I really resonated with that you said was, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners do believe that the rest of the crypto ecosystem is sort of a sandbox for Bitcoin, you know, whatever is proven out and has succeeded could later be integrated. You know, hopefully we do start to see some of these integrations later down the line. But you, you mentioned how, you know, you were advocating for some developers who have seen, let's say, successful applications on Ethereum to come build them on Bitcoin. And surprisingly, like two days ago, I saw that I forget who was developing this, but somebody was bringing Frentech to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. So you're investing in a lot of these Bitcoin projects. What are you seeing? Like, which what's a hot area that bu that builders are kind of flocking to? Yeah. So, I mean, 
right now it's kind of the wild west of, of Bitcoin, right? It, everything's pretty much needed. And um, we're seeing definitely like bids for like more developer tools. We're seeing, um, you know, getting creative with like DeFi on ordinals. Uh, for example, like Liquidium is uh, doing ordinals lending. Um, you know, I think the the full experience really is is just from start to finish is um, where the opportunity lies. And so that's where, generally speaking, it's developer tools, marketplaces, DeFi, um, I would say are the strongest ones. You know, we, we have some amazing teams that we've invested in um, in the past as well. You know, you, some of you might recognize, for example, Xverse, who basically kind of brought a similar experience to MetaMask onto Bitcoin. So, you know, basically onboarding more users into the Bitcoin space. Um, and, you know, they have 350,000 users uh, and continues to grow, which is amazing to see in a space that's still rather small, you know. Um, and then we have examples um, like Alex that are basically trying to uh, bring a centralized exchange for BRC20, which is also really new. So I think those are kind of like the general areas. Um, and there is a, you know, there is a lot of opportunity, as I said. It's, it's so new that it's, you know, if you find something that has been built on one of the other chains, there's a likelihood that there's space for it on Bitcoin today. Alexei, um, so there are a lot of Bitcoin layers that exist right now. You know, you have RSK, Sovereign, Liquid, and so on. However, we haven't really seen adoption. Why? I mean, that's a tough question, um, but I think it's not because it's on Bitcoin, right? I think there is a multitude of reasons that kind of all play together. Um, RSK came out in Blockstack, both like 2015, 16, right? They were well-funded, um, and they went head-to-head -head with Ethereum. And I think one of the first kind of challenges that they faced is that Ethereum was really going after this new community, having lots of fun experiments. I mean, Vitalik had left Bitcoin, right? He was an early kind of participant, and then he left to, to build ETH. And the challenge that our skin stacks and, and later Liquid had is they went after the core Bitcoin community, mm -hmm. uh, like for the maxis, I would say. They, they, like, then they, over, in parallel to like our skin stacks building in that space, you had this cult-like community develop around BDC, very against ETH. And the bet that I think most of these projects took was, okay, let's go and kind of, you know, convince the Bitcoin core people that, you know, we can do better and, like, we can build more products. Mm -hmm. But the, that community did not want Ethereum, right? And I think that is where their first kind of mistake was made. Instead of going out and kind of, you know, making it compatible with Ethereum, accepting, like, making it easy to bridge assets and be interoperable, um, I think a lot of the Bitcoin side chains remain isolated, siloed away from all the new developments and innovation. And as EVM became stronger and stronger, specifically Ethereum with its network effects, um, and now we also saw that many of the ETH killers were unable to succeed, um, it just showcases that you know, isolation is, is very risky and very dangerous. Um, it's also, of course, related to timing, because at that time, um, Ethereum EVM was not as strong, so you, know, you could take a bet against it. Um, but also, it, the, there's these debates, right? I'm scared between like, the, the people who wanted to have changes to Bitcoin and the core maxis and this slightly toxic debates scared away a lot of developers. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time working with people researching Bitcoin and, and at some point you know, we would start getting like, messages like, oh, you're not Bitcoin enough to go to Bitcoin conference because you were touching other chains. And kind of getting lost in these debates and, and then kind of trying to convince that community to change cost a lot of time. And I think um, the focus on more like, okay, getting new people into the space and making it like more friendly for everybody um, would have been a better success, like Ordinals has actually shown us. I mean, there's a few other technical reasons, um, but I do believe that at the core, it's uh, the direction of, of the business, right? Going after this very cult-like community that will never use yeah. anything other than holding and like sending Bitcoin, right? They will never do it. Um, I think that essentially is one of the reasons why the side chains that we have today simply were not able to amass like a, a big, big community and, and a product specifically. That makes sense. So in my presentation, one thing I was talking about is how Ordinals has enabled sovereign rollups on Bitcoin. 
So these rollups can use Bitcoin as a DA layer. And some people might not understand the significance, like why does this matter if Bitcoin can be used as a, as a DA layer? So Samantha, if I can pass that question over to you, like why, why, what's significant about you know, Bitcoin, about sovereign rollups being able to settle on Bitcoin? Yeah, one, well, we can do sovereign rollups today without any changes to Bitcoin, uh, any soft forks. Uh, none of that is required uh, to deploy. So that's that's an important thing to uh, you know to note. Uh, but in terms of like what is you know sovereign rollup actually bring that existing side chains or these existing kind of smart contract platforms on Bitcoin don't already bring. Um, you know I think I think it's really two two main things. One is uh, the the transactions on the sovereign rollup. Uh, get to inherit the double spend security from Bitcoin directly. And I think that's, that's very important uh, you know, in terms of you know, other side chains. Side chains have different mechanisms. Maybe it's merge mining. Maybe it's bootstrapping their own uh, you know, set of validators. Uh, but they, have, they don't inherit you know, in order to reorg, in order to uh, uh, double spend on a side chain. Uh, you can kind of launch that attack in an easier way, but in order to double spend uh, any transaction on the sovereign rollup, uh, that requires double spending on Bitcoin. And I think that's that's a really important security that you get to inherit as a application that users get to inherit uh, through through transactions on the sovereign rollup. Uh, so that's one. Um, you know, the other you know aspect of this as well is. Um, around this kind of goes more broadly to uh, you know why some uh, uh, decentralized applications want to deploy more as app chains uh, rather than being you know a set of smart contracts that's you know coupled with uh, a layer one or a layer two. Um, we're seeing this movement for you know more and more applications that want that sovereignty in terms of you know deciding uh, what their consensus rules are. Uh, as a community uh, for those applications, uh, we see even you know prominent protocols moving towards app chains like DYDX, uh, and sovereign rollups uh, enable uh, applications to basically be app chains that inherit security directly through Bitcoin, uh, and I think that's a really new you know powerful paradigm uh, that didn't exist before in these kinds of application uh, uh, layers. Um, Right, so I, I, you know, those are that kind of scratching the surface of, of what's kind of possible with sovereign rollups. Of course, kind of entirely new things as well, like um, if uh, we can get Tether or uh, USDC, you know, uh, to, to to mint natively on a sovereign rollup, then you can do stablecoin trading, uh, you know, like basically stablecoin payments that are fully secured through Bitcoin, and that's that's something that. Uh, doesn't exist at all today, and, and, and these are kind of applications that would uh, be possible in a sovereign roll-up platform. Yeah, that stablecoin use case sounds very important because we know that stablecoins are really the product in crypto that has really found product market fit outside of the crypto or Web3 space. And I think one other thing I'd add there is to, you know, why is this significant for Bitcoin is because it adds increased demand for Bitcoin block space, right? Bitcoin's block space right now isn't very highly utilized, and so if there are a bunch of rollups that are settling the Bitcoin, then you know this increases demand. This could possibly solve you know the security budget problem that a lot of people have been talking about recently. So on this similar note to scaling, I'm sure you guys have heard of drive chains. It's been you know very highly debated in the Bitcoin ecosystem, but I'll give a TLDR. Essentially, drive chains is this Bitcoin proposal that wants to bring native sidechain functionality to Bitcoin through merge mining. And so these miners would be able to opt into securing these other chains. And this would enable, you know, Bitcoin sidechains, for example, that could enable privacy, smart contracts, you know, higher throughput. But it's very high, highly debated. And you know, what's, what's the trade-off here? Because initially it sounds like a very good upgrade, but is there, is there something I'm missing here? 
I mean, I think there's two things to drive chains. Drive chains are as old as Stacks, RSK. This, this proposal has existed for years. Mm -hmm. like, I think it's eight years now. So as long as I've been working on Bitcoin, that has always been around. And if you look at the debates over the years, it has kind of moved from technical debate to very like personal feuds between people who are pro and contra. And you have a lot of like the way it's currently kind of you know debated is it's fueled by you know one side says oh there are no traders the other side says no it's terrible, and the technical discussions actually get lost and there is a lack of technical write up like there's a lot of material but there's no academic peer reviewed works for example that actually dig deeper into well what are the pros and cons like you have to pick together the information from different papers and sources and I think that makes it very difficult to understand well what are the risks. I mean, the pros are clear, right? You can allow miners to secure the bridge, right? Brive chains would allow us to have a two-way peg, two side chains um, that's enforced by miners, which sounds great, right? We know that light climb bridges between two different chains are the most secure bridge technique we can get, and drive chains gets Bitcoin very close to that. Um, the cons are, of course, also legitimate, right? There's a concern that suddenly miners you know, might have incentive to fork out certain yeah. blocks, um, there might be problems with these side chains. And if all miners kind of are participating in cross-chain kind of communication, it adds a very new kind of role to miners as previously just securing um, the Bitcoin network. And if you look at the equivalent to, like on Ethereum, right, which is restaking, I mean, Vitaly correctly voiced his concerns as well. Like, it, there is no free lunch. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I think that drive chains currently just lack this very technical analysis yeah. um, from probably somebody who is not as involved in this like political, politicized debate. Yeah. Um, so hopefully with like a lot of new technical teams coming into Bitcoin, building um, layer twos, rollups, and creating demand for them. And that's why we're doing Bob, right? Because we want, don't want to wait for drive chains to be adopted. We want to create demand showcase that people can build on Bitcoin, bring new builders, and then you know, have a actually more technical review of, OK, is it drive chains that couldn't make it? Is it maybe some form of ZK rollups in, in the future, or something in between? Um, and just look at the technical pros and cons, and also what enables the most use cases. Because right now, it's a very hypothetical debate. Yes, you, you, there are like some drive chain versions of Z, uh, Z, uh, Zcash, Ethereum. But nobody uses them, right? Yeah. It's, it's just demos. And I think that's essentially the missing piece, demand. Because once you have millions of users asking for it, it's a very different debate than there's a, like, you know, when, there's, when there's, it's purely a hypothetical technical proposal. I like that. So David, prior to this whole ordinals, you know, mania. There really wasn't anything you could do with your Bitcoin, right? It was like throw it into cold storage. That's about it. When Ethereum upgraded, all of a sudden Ethereum became a productive asset, right? You could earn some type of yield with it. And I'm sure if there was like a trustless way to earn yield on Bitcoin, I think there could be some people who would be willing to, you know, experiment with that. So I know you're working on a protocol, uh, Babylon that aims to enable this. Uh, would this require any changes to the Bitcoin L1, or is this something that could be enabled? Uh, so if you could just briefly kind of describe yeah. how this would work. So before I answer that question, maybe I'll give some, a little bit of context of our project. So basically, with the emergence of proof of stake chains, all the tokens associated with proof of stake chain have a new use case which is staking, right? So staking is a super important use case. We have many, many staking projects at this meeting. Um, but Bitcoin, unfortunately, is a proof of work chain. So therefore, the Bitcoin asset actually doesn't have this native use case of staking, OK? So our, in, our project basically says, hey, although Bitcoin itself is proof of work, there are still many, many other chains and new chains and upcoming chains, which are proof of stake. Why can't we use Bitcoin as an asset to stake for these other chains? OK, so that's the rationale. Now, you may say, OK, why don't I? OK, I can do that by selling Bitcoin and buying ETH or buying some other asset and stake. I can do that. But then you have to sell Bitcoin. Hey, who wants to sell Bitcoin? Nobody wants to sell Bitcoin, right? So the challenge is. We keep the Bitcoin on the Bitcoin chain, no selling, no, no bridging of the asset, and still 
be able to provide as a staking asset. So that's the problem we solved. Now, what is the biggest challenge here? The biggest challenge is that Bitcoin has very limited programmability. And the most important functionality of a staking asset is to be able to slash the asset in case there is bad behavior on the proof of stake chain, right? If it's not slashable, then it's not really a staking asset. There's nothing at stake. Of course, typically, you don't slash, but that's a deterrent for good behavior. It's like nuclear weapon. It never happens. Hopefully, it never happens. But then it's important to govern good behavior. So basically, the problem is that without a smart contract, how do you slash? So our, our approach is to use cryptography to do the slashing without any change on the Bitcoin scripting language, without any change. So that makes it very different from the drive chain approach. The drive chain approach needs to add one opcode, although it's one opcode, but in Bitcoin world, adding one opcode typically takes five years on the average. And in the case of drive chain, it was proposed, as Alexei mentioned, in 2015. Hey, man, now it's 2023. Eight years later, this opcode is still being debated. So forget it. Forget it. My, our, our, our theory is that, not theory, our hypothesis, our belief, is that you can do many things on Bitcoin without going to war <laughs> in the community to try to add some opcode. In fact, Nakamoto, Nakamoto himself or themselves deleted a bunch of opcodes in the very beginning because he found a security flaw with one of them. So this idea of Bitcoin being very secure is also very tied to the fact that people are very conservative about adding opcodes. Beautifully said. Completely agree with you. There's too much fighting. Let's just work with what we got and then you know, hope later down the line that one of these upgrades actually gets integrated. So with the remaining time, if we could just, I'd love to hear, you know, like what you're excited about on Bitcoin, you know, within the next six months, if it's a narrative, if it's a specific application or functionality, um, you know, 30 seconds if you could. We'll just start with you and then go down the line. So it's emergence of layer twos around Bitcoin rollups, sovereign rollups, and so on. And then in terms of applications, I think peer-to-peer transactions like swaps for PDC to stables on like ETH and other chains are very underutilized and there's a massive market, especially in the global south, um, that is mainly dominated by centralized exchanges that are currently getting shut down one after the other, um, especially the smaller ones. Yep. And then Bitcoin staking. So what David mentioned, right, that's one way of using like Bitcoin on the Bitcoin chain, using cryptography, but there's other methods like hash rate marketplaces and using CFI and DeFi where you use Bitcoin as collateral to borrow and then get exposure to proof of stake assets or US treasuries, right? As we've heard many, many times today about real world assets. So these are kind of the things and intersections I think are really going to see a lot of traction. Yeah, I think for, for us, we're definitely keeping an eye on the ordinal space, um, looking to see for use cases beyond just the NFT um, marketplaces, DeFi, et cetera, and, and seeing what ordinals um, can be, you know, what can be done with ordinals basically. And, um, you know, similarly to, to what um, David said, it's, it, it's basically really interesting to see builders looking beyond what has already been proposed and looking for new uh, possible use cases. And, and I think that's something that till now it, it hadn't really been happening because we know that there was this stagnation with the builder community. And um, as more builders start to come into the space and there's more hype on, on Bitcoin, we hope to see more builders like David and his team, you know, like everyone up here, thinking of different ways of, of enabling Bitcoin. So for us, it's, it's as I said in the beginning, you know, we're looking for those, uh, those core infrastructure and developer tools I think are going to be super important in the coming you know, years. Um, and then we'd love to see what else gets built beyond that. Yeah, for me, I mean, I think short, long term, I'd like to see more utility and better UX. I think those are the, 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 the two main things that I'd like to see. And I think that in the short, medium term, that's enabled through uh, much better uh, you know, application layers or layer twos or, you know, Bitcoin layers, um, particularly around sovereign rollups. Um, I think, you know, things like the 
proof of staking, I mean, enabling uh, you know, more idle, more speculative asset to be used in a more productive way. I think that's fascinating. I think in the short, medium term, that's, that's really exciting to me. In the long term, I'd like to see a zero knowledge proof verifier uh, you know, added to the consensus layer. I think that is when we'll see a Cambrian explosion of all sorts of applications uh, with amazing UX, uh, you know, native DeFi, native uh, you know, ecosystem around Bitcoin form in, in, in these trustless uh, layer twos or side chains. Uh, and I think we're one opcode away from that. Uh, of course, to David's point, I think that might be five years, but we're one opcode away from that. And it's not a new concept at all uh, to the Bitcoin community. It's something that people have been talking about since 2013. Uh, so look out for that, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, Bitcoin is not Turing complete, right? It's not Turing complete. And many people get turned away because of that. But I, I would say don't get discouraged because although it's not Turing complete, there's still many things you can do with it. And we just have to find interesting use cases and find the appropriate way of adding enough functionality to Bitcoin interacting with the outside world. Having the outside world help out Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a little bit you know, kind of death of hearing. They can't figure out too much about what's happening in the, real, in the rest of the world. So let the rest of the world help Bitcoin to understand it. And I think that's a very important way. And once we have enough momentum, then we can think about like adding up codes. So let's do it in a stepwise process, right? And say, hey, let's, let's add three up codes. Yep, that's a perfect way to end this. Thank you, everybody. And I appreciate you guys joining me. Thank you. Thank you.